welcome to the first episode of Behind the Leaf, uh, Long Beach Collective Association's Cannabis Industry and Ab Advocacy Variety Show. My name is Stephen Contreras, Community Outreach Director. And I'm Pam, Community Education Director. Each episode of Behind the Leaf will take us on a uh, LBCA member facility tour. It will also, um, we'll get glimpses of cannabis history and also we'll have conversations um, all about can cannabis as cannabis touches a lot of different issues. On this episode of Behind the Leaf, we're gonna show you the Wonder Brett Cultivation Facility here in Long Beach. We're also gonna have an in-depth conversation between the hemp with Nate from Bell Costa and Gabe from Optimal Genetics. And lastly, you're gonna join Pam on Medicated History talking about the 1944 LaGuardia Port. Come join us on this episode of Behind the Leaf. All right, let's go. Hey, what's up everyone? Steven here, Community Outreach Director for the LBCA. We're at Wonder Brett Walnut Street facility. You know what? We're gonna check out, we're gonna introduce you to the brains behind the operation. Hopefully show you some cannabis. Come join me. I'm Brett Feldman, a co-founder of Wonder Brett. We are in our Long Beach Grow facility. It is 22,000 square feet, indoor cultivation, and we provide some of the best indoor cannabis to the California marketplace. So cultivation is a relentless job. It's every day, never stop. These are like infant babies that have to be taken care of and watered three and four times a day. They don't take a break ever. And at the scale that we're at, we you know, we have 36 bloom rooms here. We filling a room, chopping a room down every other day. So the pace just never stops. It's a train that will never stop from this point forward that we have started and uh, we, hate to, we hope to keep it going forever. The brand is called Wonder Brett and I co-founded it with a partner of mine here and we are one of the very few fortunate people to found a great home in the city of Long Beach. We're really happy with the city. They give us such a, a, a great place to work out of. It's a big facility. There's 130 people here, so we got a lot of work going on. Long Beach is strategic, strategically located right off the 405 right here. The industrial zoning for the, where the location was, it's great to work here in, in SoCal and not have to be out in like the desert potentially. And it's closer to my home too. I, I've, born and raised in LA. So it's it's really just, you know, more convenient for us as a brand. It's strategic so we can be in, you know, SoCal the way we want to be. And it helps us grow our footprint to have this scale into North, Northern California as well. So you, you need a lot of product to grow to, to be as, as big as we want to be and to provide as many stores as we like. So in, in getting started in this building here, I came in a little bit towards the tail end of the project, brought in as the, as the cultivation team and as a partnership in the brand with the owners of the building. But they had been working on the process for over a year and a half with the city, two years actually, I'm being told. <laughs> My earpiece. <laughs> and now we've been here running for about eight months. We're working out all the kinks of a massive scale operation like this, I'd say that Anybody who said they turned on anything of this scale and had it go perfectly from day one would probably be telling you some stories. Regulations and taxes are the biggest hurdles to every business in this space right now. You know, like an ounce of uh, alcohol gets taxed, I think at two and three cents an ounce. Whereas here, just for us to grow this weed, before we go to sell it, like that tax that you pay for alcohol is at the, at the counter there. The tax we pay here, we get taxed just for producing this pound of weed. Whether we sell it or not, I'm gonna get pay a $9.25 tax just for trying to grow it and producing it, whether I sell it or not. It's a very unfair system to marketplace that's trying to grow and it, it's, it's not how you would want to empower this new industry. I think that as cannabis has a, a stigma that it is, we're still getting punished from the old days. I still feel like the 37% tax at the sales counter is outrageous. I'm pretty sure when California voters decided to make this product legal and create this industry and the hundreds of jobs that we're supporting here, they didn't think that we were gonna do it at 37% tax and then taxing us before the product even got to the shelf either. I mean, there's multiple levels of taxes that people just don't understand. It's very complex for anybody to survive in this space. They're not making it easy. We have 
a very unique business model here that allows us to have a kind of immunity to what's going on in the marketplace where a lot of other brands are suffering because we grow all the product ourselves, we distribute the product ourselves, and we sell it ourselves to the stores, we can, we can still get some piece of a margin that allows us to want to be here and do this, but it's by no means a heavily profitable industry. It's being taxed to death. If I sell a product at wholesale for $20 to a store, by the time the end consumer buys it, it's gonna be $60 or $65 plus taxes. So there's a lot of middleman in that space. And I'd say that, that the only person who's really made a lot of money in cannabis in the space for the past two or three years is the state of California. That they have collected you know, millions and millions of dollars uh, upon our investments and our hard work going into this space. There has to be a more sophisticated conversation that takes place for these guys to understand that they are going to kill this industry and completely, completely achieve the goal that they, you know, the opposite of the goal that they set out to do in California. This is a, a voter state mandate that made this product legal. This can't be changed. This is what California has voted for. It's gonna stay that way. And uh, there's a lot of forces at be that are trying to strangle this market out. And they are kind of happy to see the black market thrive because it allows the second war on, on drugs to take place. You know, we're, this whole thing was legalized to take people, they were getting marijuana cases and charged for this virtually harmless, very safe product to consume. Take all these people out of this war on drugs and out of these jails and it seems like it's a reinvention of that whole process again, the way that they're creating the system. I mean, you got a lot of people that have done everything they can to get their hopes and dreams into this space. They're getting their legs cut out from underneath of them at every different angle, from the way it, it, the licensing structure was put together and the timelines and the runway of capital that has to be spent to, to before you can even operate. So it's, it's way more complex than anybody really understands. Okay, so in this Long Beach facility, this is one of the most sophisticated facilities I think built in North America. We go through very strict protocols of entering this building and, and how we move through the building even in, in going from room to room. We have no outdoor clothes from outside of the world. Like what I'm wearing is my uniform that stays here inside this grow all the time. My shoes are, have never been outside of this building. They've only been inside this grow. And that's how it is for every employee. So we don't bring outside contaminants into the building. You know, we uh, have a UV air wash that will sterilize uh, as we come into the building too for every person who comes in. Uh, when we bring in products from the outside, we quarantine them, we UV light them, we uh, brush them off with air and, and, and try and keep everything as, as dust and clean, uh, dust free and as clean as possible. Through every process, we take the plants from these veg spaces, we move them meticulously and carefully into the bloom spaces. As the plants get loaded in there, they get hooked up to the water systems, they get watered four times a day, they get netted, maintenance leaves are pulled off of them. These plants are touched every day, every plant basically that you see. There's 30,000 plants in this building, in this facility. Every one of these plants gets touched by a human every day at some point, once or twice. Through that whole process, we have our very meticulous feeding regimens so that we can produce the highest grade cannabis in the space. That is what I believe has led us to be immune to kind of the forces that are out there. We produce a very high-end quality product that's limited to the marketplace and it allows us to kind of weather the storm that's going on out there. A lot of the people that are suffering are in the lower tiers that are duking it out for the, for the, the, the middle and the lower shelf. Not a lot of people built a grow facility with the intention of trying to make high-end cannabis at this scale, and this is what makes us unique here. As we go through that process, we harvest those plants down when they're of mature age, we take them into the dry rooms, they dry for a week or two. When they come out of their dry, we go into our trim facility side of the, the building, 
There's about a 20, 30 man team of trimmers and processors in there chopping up the plants and getting things all hand trimmed, no machine trim. We try and keep everything as, as clean as possible from every process. Everything is tracked through metric. You know, you, you weigh the plant as soon as you cut it down, you weigh it when it's dry, you weigh all the stems, you weigh all the leaf, you weigh all the trim, I and mean, you weigh all the, the finished flower and you get everything into metric so that we stay compliant. So metric is the state's system for track and trace of plants throughout the building and how to keep the regulations so that they know that there's no, uh, you know, plants that are getting untracked. The, the system is a little bit uh, encumbersome. It's a little bit difficult to get used to. Certain aspects could be refined. The tracking of plants like this, great. You know, I, for me, it's the best data I've ever gotten in my life as a grower to be able to look at this information on a daily basis and make data-driven decisions and, and have all this information. Some of the things that are a little redundant and kind of unnecessary is the way that they make you track plants that are dead or that were never gonna be a plant that was a clone that you, you know, that you're batching and you're labeling and you're entering the computer. And um, they be, add a lot of labor processes to the, the, the system that you know cannabis had never dealt with in the past. The whole market for California is, is a very mature market for smokers. People have been smoking cannabis in this state for 20, 30, 40 years, and they know what's good cannabis and what's bad cannabis. They have made so many more processes that have changed that business model. It is kind of historically, uh, an eighth of cannabis was like $50, $60 for a good eighth of cannabis. And this was 20 years ago. And even today, that marketplace, it has to kind of hold that value for people. That's what people believe cannabis is worth when they want to buy it. That's the value that everybody's agreed upon that that's what it's worth. When you start adding all these extra layers of metric and security, these are all these extra cost, costs that are associated that no grower in the California marketplace, when they established that price at $50 and $60, ever had to deal with, especially with the, the taxes for $150 a pound or $9.25 an ounce or the 37% tax at the storefront. It really has, you know, put a restriction and a stranglehold on the marketplace. Uh, there's only 600 stores roughly uh, that are open. So when you try and build something to scale and you realize you got to run out there with, because you have investors and you got to get out there, you got to get going, everything's costing a lot of money. You run out there and you realize there's really not a whole lot of places to run to. There used to be, in the Prop 215 era, I think more than three to 4,000 stores. So that was kind of the estimation of the marketplace, and we're supposed to have that many stores by now. But the state has moved really slow. Cities are moving kind of slow. Certain cities are still have a ban in their city on this stuff. Again, you know, the California voter I just isn't being represented the way I think we intended this to be. Yeah, so we, we chose this type of setup uh, for efficiency, for the best outcomes. This is like my dream setup as a grower. This double stack LED is very efficient. It's very organized. The impact for electricity and cooling is reduced. As a grower, it's, it really just is a farm. It's like any other farm. And farms have to have a very tight budget to survive. Um, even if you're just somebody growing walnuts or almonds, they have a lot more, uh, subsidies, farming subsidies, the ability to borrow money from banks. Uh, we get none of these situations to help us. Lending and banking in this industry would be amazing. Subsidies to help support this industry would be amazing. Farmers markets for brands and for cultivators to be able to go to a, a fairground or something like that on a monthly basis, once a month, to have a, a shot at getting their products into the marketplace the level of sophistication to get your product into the marketplace coming from a small farm is isn't achievable for most people to buy thousands of dollars of packaging, salesmen, deals with distributors. It's, they, they really have chopped the business into so many little pieces that you need to have all these licenses to have a shot at uh, to, of a sustainability in this marketplace. A, uh, the, if it had a, mar a farmer's market model, we would be able, every one of those mom and pop farms would have the ability to get at least one time a month to, to get some money in and pay their bills to keep their dream going and figure it out. If they don't, what are they gonna do? 
they're going to go back to what they did in the past, which will be a black market grow, the exact opposite of what the California voter wanted. We wanted safe, regulated cannabis in this space and not to see our friends and family go to jail for something that is, you know, the, one of the most harmless and safe things you could ever see. And it, it's just a plant. People are so scared of this plant for some reason for years and years. And even still, like the way I say, we still get treated like criminals in this space. We have, you know, regulators that show up and they're nice and stuff, but they show up in bulletproof vest. It just really makes feel everybody feel pretty uncomfortable. And it makes you feel like they're here to try and catch us do something illegal or that we're all criminals, that we were criminals and we're still criminals now or something. It's just the tone isn't like it's it's legal. Like the tone still doesn't feel that way. I think what really needs to happen is everybody needs to talk about cannabis more. Uh, the, till they're blue in the face, till their friends don't want to talk about and their family doesn't want to hear about it anymore. Because if you want change, this plant brings about change. This plant, in my opinion, it breeds compassion between people. It, it brings people together. When you smoke cannabis, people come together. It doesn't, you don't smoke cannabis and then look at somebody and go, like, what are you looking at? You know what I mean? Like, that's something that some other products kind of make you feel maybe aggressive, but not cannabis. So it has compassion built into it. From there, if we could have that conversation and talk about this, the more we talk about it, that's what actually influences society and cultural shift. And if we can change the conversation of the culture into a more uh, accepting place, then real change happens after that. You know, a lot of things that people looked at 20 years ago, like someone being vegan, they thought they were crazy. You know, now you can't go anywhere without seeing vegan stuff all over the menu. You know, so it's, it's just about changing this, the conversation and the culture of how we talk about cannabis and taking the fear out of this plant. This is not something to be feared. To be a very uh, good qualified grower, you have to have uh, dedication and love for this plant. If you don't really love cannabis, you won't put that energy into it. Kind of like anything, you know, if, if you don't like roller skating, you're never gonna be a good roller skater. Mm -hmm. So if you find love for this and the way that it makes you feel and the way that it makes you feel around your friends and the shared experiences that it gives you, then, I've, then you're starting at the right place. From there, you need a really strong work ethic. You know, the best employees I've ever had historically over the years were guys that had come from other industries where they were breaking their back, you know, doing plumbing underneath a house or something like that. And, and then they came inside to this nice grow facility that's controlled, it's warm, it's, you know, you, all you had to do is just kind of listen to some good music in your headphones and work on the plants. And it's, it's kind of a very nice, relaxing, uh, meditating almost type uh, environment when you when you uh, get into the cultivation space. It becomes very calming, very home feeling. Okay, so I have a qualm with the term master grower. <laughs> the people like to throw it out there like they're master growers, but uh, I'd say like a chief grower or the, the head grower or something like that, because master is so egotistical and, and no one's ever gonna master this plant. No one can master it. Uh, it's untamed, it's wild. Basically, you can be a very experienced grower and be a head you know, of the cultivation. And at head cultivation, uh, a guy for his salary normally gets anywhere from like 80 to 120, 120,000 a year, depending on his level of skill and how many head cultivators are there. People think that, maybe you're assuming right now that I'm the head cultivator here and I make every decision completely wrong. Um, I make decisions for my brand. I have a huge team of people that support us here, people that do data collection, people that are working on the plants, people that are helping develop our ethos for our company, the way that we want to present ourselves to the community. It's not contrived, it's organic and original. It's just, we put a lot of thought into how this is. We want to change the conversation. We want the culture to shift and we want real change and changing the world through plant of cannabis. I can't think of something that would make me feel, feel more proud to be a part of and, and, and employing hundreds of people along the line, you know, not just the people that are in this building, it trickles down into distro companies and sales teams and bud tenders and shops 
and it, it just keeps going. Like, this is probably one of the most you know fast growing sectors for jobs in in the country. Maybe you know, like I bet you we're up there with tech, you know, on on growth and expansion. There's so many more people now that can feed their family in the state in the city of Long Beach, you know, because of city of Long Beach side they're open their arms up wide and embrace groups like myself and and allow us to do this this is amazing so uh, we have about 140 employees here right now um, when we started onboarding the facility we um, went directly to the social equity program and got as many people as we could um, from there we kind of exhausted that list and uh, started hiring more people from there um, not everybody in the social equity program worked out for us. Um, we've retained about 30 of those people on staff right now, and they've worked out great. Um, working with uh, the city of Long Beach hand-in-hand -hand on this process has been just amazing. Uh, you know, being a grower and hiding in the shadows for years of what I was doing and never really having any interaction with, you know, authorities or the city or voicing anything, um, you know, for so many years and finally being able to actually have this conversation and talk about it and be a part of conversations with the city, uh, it's, it's really a dream come true for me because I've always dreamt of cannabis being legal, respectable, classy, and not the stereotypical, stereotypical image that they've painted in all the movies, which is very fun and, you know, funny for, and entertaining. I love those movies growing up, but it's not a real depiction of the uh, average consumer of cannabis. So, uh, no, we don't do any drug testing here in, in the facility on our employees. Um, we do do uh, drug testing for any of our drivers for distro because that is the law. Uh, we follow everything to the letter of the law here. We are not gonna ruin this opportunity or let this turn into something that's a, you know, a bad thing for the city. We're gonna do everything we can to protect this and keep it pure and good. I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody uh, in Long Beach for allowing us to cultivate in your city. Uh, we're really thankful. We feel very blessed to have this opportunity and uh, we will make everybody in the city very proud. Thank you. I just want to thank my mom and dad for <laughs> letting me get away with growing pot in their house, you know, and uh, learning how to do this. <laughs> Thank you. So we just finished our tour. You checked out the grow, you saw the water, you talked to Brett. You know what? Go try some of your the Wonder Brett today. So uh, we are your host for uh, Between the Hemp. I'm Gabe Rodriguez. I'm the Chief Science Officer of Optimal Genetics. My name is Nate Winokur. I am the Bell Costa Labs VP and very happy to be here tonight. So thank you guys for having us. Uh, we are very excited to be the guest host for this. In fact, we really want to have an opportunity to kind of introduce the whole sort of science and education part of the industry. This is some stuff that we're really big about and we want to have the opportunity to kind of use this soapbox and platform to talk about that as much as humanly possible. So Gabe, what are we here to talk about? Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, like Nate was saying, we should definitely touch on the back end of the industry. All you guys really get to see is, uh, the dispensaries, the, the consumption side. Um, I feel like you guys should get a good touch on how your extracts are made. How is all the lab side of things being created so that you guys could be safe? You guys could smoke a good uh, product that you know you could feel confident in smoking and sharing with your family or your friends. You know, and I think that's what we're here to touch on right now. So um, I think we could start touching on different types of extraction and why we use these different types of extraction to do what we do. So uh, right now we have a, a couple things on the board right here. Um, we have some BHO from Connected. 
Seven Tens has their uh, rosin. Mm -hmm. And then I have some carts from my company, Optimal Genetics, that we use a uh, ethanol extracted distillate. So It's all good stuff. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. I'd hope to think that, yeah. We definitely are picky smokers. All right. So, well, maybe we should try some of this out as we go forward. What yeah. is your favorite extraction method and why? All right. Well, um, definitely my pedigree that I have behind me is uh, butane extraction. I've been extracting with butane for since about 2013. So back when uh, glass tubes were still a thing. Um, I thank goodness you were using glass and not PVC, right? Absolutely. Because that was I didn't thing. want to, I didn't want anything to leach into my into my smoke. I wanted to be so somewhat. Should we explain what we're you know? Let's, oh, dude, let's, absolutely. Let's, let's dissect this a little bit. So once upon a time, when people found out that you could make extractions from butane, what we ended up seeing people do was at first people needed a place to do it. So typically your backyard or your garage mm -hmm. sometimes. A hotel room with uh, plenty of, you know, random sparks was the place to go. Yeah, of course. Um, next, and carpet. And lots of carpet. <laughs> next, you would need a tube, and this tube would be packed full of cannabis. And often people, without even thinking that solvents would be able to leach chemical from these tubes, right, mm -hmm. would reach for the cheapest, most available thing. And they would just reach for PVC this chunk of PVC plastic. tube plastic. And it was a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. And what you would do, just to you know, give you all the the, the complete blueprint of uh, how to do something illegal in your backyard, <laughs> is they would pack it full of cannabis, and they would drill little holes on either end, and they would fill it full of butane, like straight out of the canister, oh, yeah. and then right into a dish. Into an open and dish. Assuming you're surviving at this point and that oh, yeah. you've neither blown yourself up from the butane nor be attacked by bees from the fumes, mm -hmm. now we're hoping that you have the opportunity to boil all this butane off and now you collect all of the sticky poison that's left over. Butane and call, hash oil. And, and call it good. And call, it, yeah, call yourself yeah. a genius for circumventing the system. Call yourself an extract artist. So... As much as I like to, to uh, clown on this, I think this is where a lot of us kind of started. I saw something wrong with the PVC type pipes. Absolutely. I used the glass tubes too. I was using glass tubes and to even take matters even higher. Um... Like I was doing it right back then. I wasn't doing it right. <laughs> yeah, that was the no. one thing I did right. I used glass but tubes. But I mean like, uh, you know, I did my due diligence. I, I did know that... Uh, removing undesirables from your extracts such as like fats and lipids you know it was due to having cold solvent and being able to separate those things so what i would do is i would open blast mind you into a mason jar that was covered around dry ice in a small cooler and i would let that separate for 24 hours and then i would have a hand uh pumped uh buckner funnel okay. so i would have a you know a glove that i could strain all my solvent into and I would hand pump that's through smart, a Buckner dude. punnel yeah, that's smart. so that I could de-wax. And the whole point of it was that, you know, back in the day when you had shatter and it would butter up, it's because people thought it had butane in it. You know, mm. they were like, oh, that, sh that stuff sugared up. Like, I can't sell it anymore. It has butane. And then I'm like, oh, it just hasn't been properly made. It wasn't de-wax or whatever it was. And I would get to go to a shelf having three to four times the shelf life than other types of shatter. So... By the time that the consumer got it and smoked it, it was still perfect, you know. So I I tried to make some. I tried to make the worst situation a little bit better, you know. Uh, slowly graduated to a precision in around 2014. Uh, from there, I've used you know Bogart V1, V2, V3. I use a Sweet Leaf V1, V2, V3. Um, designed several Busy Bee machines with Boris. So, yeah, I think uh, for my take, hydrocarbons are easily some of the best solvents to use, especially since it takes technically the least amount of energy consumption to do that. You're using a non-polar solvent, and cannabis is a polar cannabinoid. So having that positive and negative just pushes everything down so much easier. It takes less work and everything. Ethanol, they're both polar, so it's a lot more you know, agitation and energy to really get all those cannabinoids out of there. So, you know, using BHOs is a good starting point. You know, it's 
at that base on a chemical level, it's kind of like, yeah, that's, that's how sh we should start. Good words. Good words. So you prefer butane. Yeah. I'd like to think that butane extract is kind of the heart and soul of good quality, like the origin of what a good quality extract was. Absolutely. I think once upon a time, people put a lot of attention on hash. Mm -hmm. Butane, at least for me and so many others that I knew, kind of kicked that up, made people really interested in what a good quality dab, a good quality hash oil might be. And really, you know, hash and rosin and, you know, live rosin and all that stuff has really kind of kicked in and of kind of taken over, you know, the other end of what a high-end uh, concentrate might end up being. Well, and I so mean, there are a few more of these out there that are sort of doomed to small batch. Of course, yeah. And hash is sadly somewhat doomed to small batch, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, I do feel like a big reason why rosin and hash got that big push was because BHO was being was just so easy to make. It was... It was more accessible to produce at the time and we were able to have you know fresh frozen we had real terpene preservation going on at That's these times and hash really wasn't taking that that stance you know the more uh, polar uh, hydrocarbon style extract you know butene and propane specifically yeah. is what we're talking about really did take that whole idea of live extraction and turn it into something, didn't it? Yeah, of course. Like that wasn't really something that I had ever seen prior to. Of course. Hydrocarbon, common hydrocarbon extraction. Yeah, no, live live resins was definitely not a thing until, you know, people started really paying attention to how how do your terpenes evolve as you're drying out your plant, as you're curing it, as you're bagging it up? Like all those steps were really removing a lot of those things that you honestly need to get that full entourage effect. For your high so i feel like a lot of the attention to uh taking out and remove and uh removing you know what uh, let me back that up a lot of attention to not co-extracting certain compounds like the fats like the lipids really came around that time as well and we kaboom <laughs> i feel like a lot of uh different pieces of attention at least into more of a mainstream kind of audience and more in terms of what people uh intended for really came available at that point and really started to make some headway so like a less fatty product and what that meant obviously was something that really came from around that time of yeah. hydrocarbon extractions you know i try to extend that sentence as much as possible as i was distracted trying to light this I don't know, I feel it, job. but it, it, it definitely is. There was, there was a point in time where, you know, extracts wasn't really a hot topic and that wasn't at all thought about until there was, you know, our pioneers little by little that were saying, so what makes cannabis cannabis? Like, why is it this way? Why do we get this effect from everything? It's because of all these live cannabinoids, live terpenes that are ever ever changing we should have things that are especially on flower that are like kind of like a, a time bomb that just states that after this date you're nowhere near gonna get the same high it doesn't matter that you still have all those all that thc all that cb everything it's just not going to be the same without all those terpenes still being alive and intact so having bho having all those live resin extractions that was something that we never got to see before and it really changed the game that's why everything else stepped up after that you know and uh i think a good thing to touch on after would uh <coughs> what do you think would be like a co2 or an ethanol i think co2 was the next thing after butane co2 was something that got a lot of attention for a minute watch that my bad boy oh, yeah, might want to drip i was trying to figure out how i could control it before and it's it's on its own path you know we're gonna enjoy it while it lasts yeah, I'm just going to do the old turnaround until yeah, it right. doesn't drip on me. Yeah, I know. Hopefully it's... that'll work. Yeah, yeah, I just turn it like a spit, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I got it. Yeah, you got this. Um, so, CO2, uh, we can talk about that for a minute. CO2 is something that is not very well um, geared towards, I think, in, you know, maybe my most humble opinion, not ideal 
always with cannabis. There are certain conditions where I would recommend CO2 extraction with cannabis. Of course. And with uh, some of the specialized terpene celebration. Or celebration. Uh, separations. That's what I wish I could say. <laughs> some of the terpene separations early in those cycles with mm -hmm. some of the technologies out there uh, is golden. I think it produces amazing terpene profiles, lightning quick. And, yeah. Um, fairly extensive extraction as well high mm. yield as well uh, so something that we all can get kind of stoked on in terms of the source material and what it could provide generally speaking i would say that for the sake of trying to find an extraction method that adequately uh, removes the cross-section of chemicals from cannabis that i would like to see removed uh, I would argue that uh, CO2 doesn't do that very effectively. Yeah, I mean, like, one of the big arguments that I would always see from CO2 producers was that, you know, especially me being a butane extractor at the time, was they would always tell me, like, well, butane isn't ever going to be regarded safe as a smokable product because of how it was extracted, you know? CO2 Which is I regarded. With I, that but then that, that takes people like you that's and your lab. Sure if you're not careful. Oh, good. Nice catch. <laughs> but yeah, but that's where people like you and your lab, Belcasa, take the, the stance to be able to educate people. It's all about education. Without that, we really don't go anywhere with cannabis, you know? And um, the big thing about CO2 is that it's generally regarded as safe. You're never really going to have any type of. Um, you know, bad effect from consuming a CO2 extract. It's always going to be safe. It's always going to be the same flavor, sadly. Um, there was a study in 2019 that was conducted in Spain about CO2 extracts versus any other type of extracts. And it stated that because of the supercritical conditions that you need to really extract with CO2, is that you're changing the chemical composition of cannabis. Like, everything tastes the same, after you remove, you know, your, your first steps of terpene passes, everything's exactly the same, you know? If you ever smoke CO2 extracts and they would say, oh, this is OG, it would taste like CO2. Or you would smoke Jack and it would still taste like CO2. Well, it would be, I mean, so it all has that really oaky, woody flavor exactly. that gets extracted, which is pretty unique to CO2. I wouldn't say that's a generally a very much of a cannabis flavor. Of course. Simply spoken, the uh, pressure that you would run into through CO2 extraction would volatize a ton. And I mean, just a ton of the compounds as you go through the entire chemical profile of the sought after compounds, mm -hmm. you know, hundreds of degrees difference right there from the top, from the bottom to the top of the profile. You'll end up getting maybe in a lot of the conditions I've seen CO2 not being the most ideal for that. But in terms of some of the chemicals that have that are removed and some of the opportunities to further work with them, like I've said, like I said, I've seen some really good CO2 extractions out there. Mm -hmm. um, not what I've generally preferred in terms of other conditions, largely how much power it takes and the expense of some of those systems. Exactly. And things like that. But for people doing that, that's a uh, that's a good condition for uh, for certain levels of extraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be definitely, I guess, is to say a con about CO two. It's just that, um, yeah, it's just that it takes extensive amounts of energy. It takes extensive amounts of power to really run these machines and whatnot. And uh, you know, butane definitely doesn't have that. Um, Ethanol, I think, would say would be the <coughs> easiest to really scale up. Um, just by the simplicity, the simplicity of the fact that, you know, ethanol is just an alcohol. It's a flammable solvent. It's not a um, explosive solvent like butane. When butane does light up, it makes that poof. And then when you light up ethanol, it's just, you know, a... A standard little flame it's not really doing much like a lighter yeah, it doesn't either. burn very hot either yeah so it's generally a hundred times safer than butane extraction and uh, I'm sure it would be a lot easier to get by your um, your fire chief doing a heavy ethanol extraction <laughs> it's uh, I would say one of the uh, failings of ethanol though is that um, you know extracting a live product fresh frozen 
is it really an option because nope. of the polar nature of ethanol, right? Yeah. And there's not too much else to say to that other than to the camera, what we're basically talking about is that because of how ethanol molecules are shaped, uh, you're not able to extract fresh frozen through them. It's more yeah. of an option through butane. And then in terms of small batch stuff, you also have the ability to do hash extractions like that as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's definitely a, a downside for ethanol is that, um, like I was saying, the polarity. So ethanol is polar and so is cannabis. It's going to take a lot of agitation, a lot of energy to really get all your cannabinoids and all the things that you really want out of that plant. And not only that, you still have to recover your ethanol. You still have to dis distill it into distillate or if you want to isolate it into your isolates. Um, definitely takes a lot more energy after that, which CO2 still, for the most part, needs ethanol to be fully dewaxed and then distilled after as well. So you could take that into consideration on both. Yeah, usage of secondary solvents definitely uh, lengthens the process a lot. You know, that's something to consider. So we've got those and we have the, the needs between those. Yeah. Let's talk about terpene profiles and what might be separated from each one of those. Absolutely. And I think a good way to explain that is just simply in boiling points for a lot of these. Uh, butane, propane, very low boiling points. As you recover the butane and propane, it's not necessary to get it very hot, mm -hmm. and so you don't volatilize a lot of the terpenes and the other volatile compounds that terpene aren't preservation. Terpenes. That is a good good point. Yeah. Next, you'll consider the opportunities for everything beyond uh, butane, um, CO two. Well, obviously, we're looking not at you know necessary you know, heat being linked to solvent recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're looking at high pressure, you know, that's gonna, we don't quite know where we're at temperature wise, but we know it's enough to obliterate a lot of terpenes. Absolutely. Uh, ethanol, we've got about 80 degrees Celsius boiling point right there. Mm -hmm. So 80 degrees Celsius yeah, boiling uh, point. Yeah, ethanol we could pretty much just uh, toss out the corner on the terpene preservation side type of thing. But do we cover the ideas behind ethanol? Like ethanol is not bad, as you've mentioned. It's mm -hmm. a very safe means of extracting, and you have that going for it. And you know the fire chief is apt to offer to offer you know a scalability easy permit. on that as well. You know would that be is all good points. Yeah. So it's good for mass extraction, right? Yes, I'd say um, you know like your typical crude, which is the base of making distillate. So carts such as mine, we definitely do use crude to start out with. That joint is out of control. <laughs> I know. We're doing good though. Nice little, probably like a point three of oil still on this joint. Hopefully, yeah, I have no idea what's going to happen there. Yeah, uh, it's going to end up on my shoe or his shoe, so we'll find out. Anyhow. <coughs> Let's take a moment as we you know, essentially run through some of the ideas behind, you know, volatile preservation and all of these. Let's take an idea towards what is a small batch versus large batch kind of idea. I always like to use orange juice as an example. Okay. So what's large batch orange juice? Well, large batch orange juice is making orange juice from concentrate. Mm -hmm. People don't make orange juice from concentrate because they hate you. Yeah. They make orange juice from concentrate because... They want to be able to take a whole kind of, uh, call it formula, and take that same scalable formula as something that you can replicate all over the board. You know, this is now a formula-based product. And that's large-scale, you know, grocery store, can find it anywhere you go type of product. Yeah, that's a good bottom line type of product as and well. And that is a large-scale product. Mm -hmm. Then you have fresh-squeezed fresh orange juice. That counts right down to the damn orange you're using, let alone the tree, let alone the region that tree is in or the pasture that tree is a part of, fresh squeezed orange juice is something that is potentially only going to ever be tasted on the most strict levels of what could be a small batch product. You don't have the ability to send your orange juice to every state. You're lucky to sell out of your oranges that day, mm -hmm. right? So that's what a craft product's like. That's some small batch shit. Oh, yeah. But then you have large batch and people with factories making orange juice. And is their stuff even close to the fresh squeeze stuff? Not even close. No. You don't have those natural compounds that made that orange special, right? Mm -hmm. That's a small batch product. 
But if you happen to be a fan of this store brand, large scale orange juice, good news, it's always going to be there forever, right? And there are pros and cons of these large batch and small batch kind of products. And so right. cannabis being an awesome little plant here. Let's see if I can do anything to doc this. This might be a mistake. <laughs> Here I'll, I'll touch on a little bit on the on the subject as well as we're as we're still on it. So um, uh, I do ethanol extraction now with Optimal Genetics. Uh, with our one centrifuge, we're able to process about nine hundred pounds on an eight-hour shift, with only one person in hand. You don't need any more. So one person in eight hours can process nine hundred pounds of material. Only? Just just to really break that down into consideration, when just I was. When I was processing BHO and whatnot, um, you know, maybe on a good day, I was probably processing anywhere between 60 to 100 pounds, 100 pounds being excessively high <coughs> of pure, fresh frozen, live resin extracts. You know, we were mostly making HTE, HT, what is it, HTSFE or HTFSE? High terpene full spectrum HTFSE. <laughs> I always have to say it whenever I get it. Um, but yeah, so that's definitely something that's, you know, small scale versus large scale ethanol can really, really scale up. And that's, we're talking one machine here and one person, you know, say you have 10 people, that's 9,000 pounds on an eight hour shift. That's ridiculous. We're really talking numbers there. Um, hash, you need to have a walk-in freezer, you know, you need to have, um, uh, RO water that's made exactly on the spot on that day because if not if you have stagnant water if you're using other water that could leach into the extract there's so many variables that goes into hash too so that really does restrict it into being small small batch but that's why people like 710 you know get to provide such awesome products mm -hmm. yeah some of my favorites right now i'm like many many can can agree with i'm a bit of a cannabis snob in terms of what I'm smoking but I'm not uh, you know I'm not simply committed to the uh, hash you know or the live rosin or just yeah. rosin or necessarily to uh, the BHO good stuff is good stuff and uh, clean stuff is clean stuff and there is a massive difference mm -hmm. between clean good craft product and not <laughs> absolutely so yeah glad definitely we're smoking the good stuff i can attest to that as well that's why every every time i would either only smoke either things that i would produce or my close friends were producing and uh my background i was also working for uh bamf at the time and they were practically some of the people that really invented um ice wax you know dabable hash that really wasn't a thing back in the day i mean you'd have bubble hash you know you'd have your half melt quarter melt, three quarter melt, and full melt. Even those terms got pretty badly bastardized. <laughs> and those terms were terrible. That's not that's a completely other topic, I would say. Hash oh, yeah, is that system, hash that system, requires uh, its own thing because it's thousands of years old. That system got given the business for sure. Yeah. So, you know, I was definitely lucky to be working for people such as Banff and uh him and Nick T were really some of the pioneers for, like I said, ice wax, dabbable hash, not even rosin before rosin and so Nate I know you've told me about your background on um, how you got here essentially but please tell me again how you got into the analytical data side of cannabis thank you for asking man uh, would you like to smoke what's left of this monstrosity of a joint? I'm going to do my best and then just uh, kill it after. It, it, yeah, no, go for it. It's, it's pretty <laughs> much leaked on me at this point. Um, how I got started in analytics has to do a little bit with having made myself uh, a little bit of a mainstay in the community before you know really having gotten into it. I knew quite a few companies out there and quite a few organizations. One of them introduced me to a lab that existed around 2010, a very large scale lab that exists now. And I jumped on board with them. And Are we allowed to say me. the name of said lab or is this a well, disclosed uh, situation? It doesn't matter, but just so people know, it's an extremely reputable lab. It's, it's 
probably of why some of the reasons why we're here now. So, so by by working with a large scale lab, and so what I'd like to highlight mostly would be the market that chose to use that lab. It was a self regulated market, which there are issues with a self regulated market. Prop but one of the things that Prop two fifteen, yeah. yeah. One of the things that's worth highlighting is that those people didn't really need to test their product, but they chose to. And even though they didn't go to the extent that testing exists now, it still created a need and a profession and a foundation for testing. A standard as well for cannabis. Yeah, standards, I would, re- I would say it was It was the beginning. I'd say, I'd say we were trying to pave that. But the people who chose to use it, who allowed those businesses to exist, they allowed cannabis people to now take a hold in that industry and in that place, which is a huge deal because Mm -hmm. now we had the opportunity for cannabis people to be able to take a part of this new need and actually run with it. And those people happened to include me. And so way back then I was involved in all sorts of operations. Look at that smoke go, man. It's oh, I know. Stuff. It's all that oil. <laughs> yeah, right? You guys like that smoke? I'm like perfectly in smoke also in the camera. All right, yeah, no, I like it. It's good ambiance. Yeah, I know. It's perfect. Hi, I'm Susan Sorries, and I have been a cannabis activist for 15 years. I started the nonprofit organization CARE, whose mission is to create awareness of the benefits of the cannabis plant. And I do that by having events, uh, because that's what I'm good at. Over here on my wall, I've got two awards from the mayor of Los Angeles, Mayor Hahn, this was a long time ago, I did these movie making technology events when High Def Digital first came out and he gave me two different awards and then I transitioned my event skills into helping with the the cannabis uh, movement. Back then we called it a movement, now it's an industry. But uh, worked really hard on Prop 19, worked really hard on uh, repeal cannabis prohibition. We tried to get it to happen in 2014. This is, uh, I got Grace Slick to endorse the Repeal Cannabis Prohibition Act, and we would be in a much better place today had we been able to convince people that it was okay to run a voter initiative without a presidential campaign, which we're going to talk more about that next year. Uh, So what I do is I do uh, two events. I do the State of Cannabis. Um, This is my poster from uh, last year, 2019. We've got a lot of senators and city council members and mayors and uh, the regulators and the industry together for two days to set policy uh, in, a, in a, a very comfortable environment, an elegant environment. I also do a, an artist gifting event during Coachella because uh, Coachella is very anti-cannabis and I found that out seven years ago. So I started doing um, um, It's called The Green Oasis, and I invite the artist to come over uh, by invitation only, appointment only, and uh, we give them swag bags full of cannabis products. We talk about uh, what they are, we talk about cannabis in general, we talk about politics, all kinds of things. So this is, we've got, we're doing the Super Bowl party right now, and these are, this is an example of my swag bags. These are the posters from uh, uh, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, and this is this year's poster. These are my business licenses from the city of Long Beach. Um, I, was, I was applying for the business license under CARE, whose name, uh, what the initials stand for is Cannabis Awareness Rallies and Events. And so I wrote that out in the application, and then here's the actual application, and it says, will you uh, use, deal with, store or transport medical cannabis. Well, actually, this was a long time ago, so they said marijuana. It's marijuana. And I checked yes, and they sent me this email, and they're like, well, we need to see you in person. And so I went down to the planning department, and I talked to somebody for about half an hour, and then I, uh, they had me talk to his boss, 
And then they said, sure, we'll take your money. So they took my money and I got grandfathered in uh, to, they gave me a license to do cannabis event, events in the city of Long Beach. And then I got one the next year and then the next year they, I had an event and they thought I was breaking the law. I wasn't, but uh, I had to hire an attorney and we took care of it. But then after that they started putting office only. So I, this is current. So I have a license from the city of Long Beach to do cannabis events. Um, but yeah, I'm here to teach people about growing cannabis because I feel like once you grow cannabis, if you've never grown anything in your life, once you grow cannabis, you're going to love growing because it's so interesting. It's so much fun to grow. And maybe you'll transition and start growing some of your own food. But regardless, once you grow it, you will appreciate cannabis even more. So uh, I recently wrote a book called What's Growing in Grandma's Garden. And it's a true story. It's a story about myself and my grandson. We love to garden together. And uh, in Grandma's garden, I've got uh, carrots and beets right now, garlic. I've got peas and beans and kale and kratom and cannabis. I've got a new strain that I'm working on. It's a cross between Sunset Sherbert OG and Banana OG. And it's very interesting. I've got a male and a female back there. Uh, I've got a cross between Gorilla Glue, Blue Dream, and Clementine. It's very purple, I'm able, because Long Beach is special, and I'm able to grow cannabis in my backyard year round. So if you have six plants and you grow year round in your backyard, it's very economical. Uh, I only use water and warm casting tea, so it's 100% organic, and I can get a really nice, I can grow enough cannabis for me and all of my neighbors. <laughs> It was really strange because I never thought about writing a book and um, I was on the Woody show which is the uh, it's on 98.7 it's the number one drive show in in LA and some other major markets and Woody asked me how how I talked to my kids about cannabis and I didn't because back then my kids are my kids have kids so back then it was like you don't talk about that you know, so I felt bad though. And I started interviewing people for a year, grown-ups, and asking them how they talked to their children about cannabis and they just weren't. And so I was like, well, we have to talk to our children. I mean, it's legal now. We, you know, this is ridiculous. So we need a tool. So I'm gonna write a children's book. I've got a story here. My grandson and I love to garden together. He knows that that's my medicine and that's my relaxing, herb and um, he knows not to touch it. He knows it's just for grown-ups. And so I wrote the book and did the research and went through the process. And it's been really a lot of fun. It's been uh, quite an adventure. It's, it's uh, don't write a book to make money. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about making money. It's about getting people educated. I love cannabis. <laughs> it's amazing. It is amazing in so many ways. I love it topically. I love it when I get writer's block. I love it to keep my migraines from ever coming back. Um, it's just, it, it, there's, there's a cannabis product for almost every adult. It's, uh, it's not gonna be easy finding the right one because we don't know that much about it, but um, you know, there's, there's something, some kind of cannabis product that's gonna make your life better. Hi, this is Medicated History. My name is Pam Chada Sawadi and I am the, what am I? <laughs> Break it down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Pam Chada Sawadi and I am the Director of Community Education for the LBCA. And I'm here with Medicated History. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about the LaGuardia Committee Report. And I'll tell you a little bit, since this is the first Medicated History, I'll tell you a little bit about what this segment is. It's just like a little piece of moment in Canada's history. It could be any part, talking about anything um, for just a few minutes. So I'm talking about LaGuardia. Um, and this was in 1944. 
And the purpose of this report is um, the Marijuana Tax Act from 1937, since this is 1944. Um, the Marijuana Tax Act was implemented in 1937. That was the beginning of Canada's prohibition. Um, that was put together by Henry Anslinger, who was head of the FBN at the time, Federal Bureau of Narcotics, our government, basically. Anyways, so that was the start of it. So I'm talking about this report. And during this time, um, Mayor Fior, I, I'm just not Italian. So Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia. Fiorello LaGuardia. And I'm actually married to an Italian, which you know makes, this, makes that just worse, because I can't even say I didn't pronounce Italian. <laughs> OK, so LaGuardia report. So Mayor LaGuardia, he actually you know, it is rumored, it doesn't say in the report, but it is rumored that he had problems with, he had problems with the Marijuana Tax Act. Like, he didn't believe, he just didn't think that it was, it was appropriate. Because it's really based in, it was based in racism, and he didn't believe in that. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about what he said. So, he, had, he wrote a foreword, and this is what he says. My own interest in marijuana goes back many years to the time when I was a member of the House of Representatives. Thank you. And in that capacity, heard of the use of marijuana by soldiers positioned in Panama. I was impressed at that time with the report of an army board of inquiry which emphasized the relative harmlessness of the drug and the fact that it played a very little role, if any, in the problems of delinquency and crime in the canal zone. Very interesting, right? He, he um, collaborates with the New York Academy of Medicine. And, here you go, I'm going to pass that to somebody. And he did a study. And my background is in public health. So this is pretty much a basic assessment of the community. <laughs> they do a study. Um, he basically went to um, Manhattan and parts of Harlem and did um, a basic community assessment. That's how this was set up. They also did a study, though, with some people from the prisons. So they also did like a sociological study on people in the prisons, which they were like, OK, let's get some volunteers from the prison because it was 1944. That's what they did. And um, they did that study there. When Ann Slinker put 19, the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act, when that went in place, it was really based on his facts, which weren't really facts. It was his opinions and his racism. And so um, because of that influenced politicians like him, this is what they thought of that. As mayor of the city of New York, it is my duty to foresee and take steps to prevent the development of hazards to the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens. When rumors were recently circulated concerning the smoking of marijuana by large segments of our population, and even by school children, so it's like a rumor that Ann Slinger had put out into the community. Um, I sought advice from the New York Academy of Medicine, as is my custom when confronted with problems of medical import. So they did this study. And this is what they found. And I got to find it, because I have all these little marks in here from doing some other, other research. <laughs> OK, here we go. Conclusions. From the foregoing study, the following conclusions are drawn. Marijuana is used extensively in the borough of Manhattan. That's really funny, because Manhattan, you were like, that's where like the uppity people lived, right? 1944. <laughs> so mostly, it was probably rich white people that were living in Manhattan that were the most consumers. So marijuana is used extensively in the borough of Manhattan, but the problem is not as acute as it is reported to be in other sections of the United States. Number two, the introduction of marijuana into this area is recent as compared to other localities. Number three, the cost of marijuana is low and therefore within the purchasing power of most persons, which is really nice because compared to like today in the legal market, it's really not affordable. It's a problem we're having right now. Um, but it was some kind of relief that was affordable to people. It's very nice. So number four, the distribution and use of marijuana is centered in Harlem. So our growers were in Harlem, and our consumers were in Manhattan. That's a pretty interesting dynamic. <laughs> um, number five, but again, this is just like assessment what we would do with any kind of 
public health, any kind of community assessment. Number five, the majority of marijuana smokers are Negroes and Latin Americans. That was because of the jazz community and the Spanish-speaking community. Um, and that's a topic, that's another, another moment in history, cannabis history. Okay, number six. The consensus among marijuana smokers is that the use of drug creates a definite feeling of adu adu adequacy. Medicated history. <laughs> Whose idea was this? <laughs> The practice of, number seven, the practice of smoking marijuana does not lead to addiction in the medical sense of the word. This is in 1944. I'm not even sure at that moment in time, like what, what, what were like the, how far did they get with addiction research? Like how far were they in 1944? Like, I'm sure they knew of alcohol because we had alcohol prohibition. But like how far in like opium addiction, they knew that too. But like they didn't come across like sugar addiction yet possibly, or like nicotine, cause like that was, that was when big tobacco took off kind of, maybe before that. Number eight, the sale and distribution of marijuana is not under the control of any single organized group, which is, that means that there was many different farmers <laughs> and they all shared. And it wasn't just one particular group. That means like everybody kind of shared and grew if they wanted in that in that space. Number nine, the use of marijuana does not lead to morphine or heroin or cocaine addiction, or no effort is made to create a market for those narcotics by stimulating the practice of marijuana smoking. And that was in 1944, they made that connection. Uh, number 10, marijuana is not the determining factor in the commission of major crimes. All right, so you know, that's really interesting because in 1944 they're asking that and I still get this question. I still get the question of, how much crime is there around a dispensary? How much crime is there around a cannabis business? And no, um, not even 1944. Um, 11, marijuana smoking is not widespread among school children. All right. Number 12, juvenile delinquency is not associated with the practice of smoking marijuana. 13, the publicity concerning the catastrophic, catastrophic effects of marijuana smoking in New York City is unfounded. And that is the biggest one. And you're wondering, well, Pam, well, how come the 1937, now I have two joints. Why, why was the 1937 Tax Act still in place after this study? Like it was, um, that it was viewed as unconstitutional in 1970, but that's a whole other story. But you know, you're like, why do you have this study that the mayor did with the New York Academy of Medicine? It was because Anslinger and the administration at that time deemed this whole study unscientific and not credible. And that is the story of LaGuardia Community Report, New York, USA, 1944. <laughs>